You know, I'm like everyone else. I, I have a Bible on my phone, and I have a Bible on my, my pad, and I've got Bibles galore on my desktop computer. But there's just something I've always liked about holding on to God's Word. The Bible always, to me, just feels good. And sometimes I like to just, I just like to hold it close. I, smell, I, I like the way it smells. Uh, it gives me comfort. It gives me hope. Uh, I love my Bible. And, uh, have I read through it? Yeah, I have. Do I remember a lot of it? Well, not as much as I used to. But I do love it. And, and I want to talk about it some this morning. I want to offer you some things that you probably already know. So maybe they are reminders. But, but, but I want to, to offer you something. Let, let me begin this way. There was a, a church that was seeking a new pastor. And this uh, recent, young, very young, recent seminary graduate was invited to speak on a Sunday morning. And he had high hopes of impressing them, that they would call him back, that he would be considered among the candidates. So to show his intellect, he, he used every lofty spiritual term he could come up with, every uh, uh, Greek words. Um, just, he just really loaded up with it and really to, in, to impress, you know? Theological terms, uh, boy, he used them. Some of them he mispronounced, uh, but he didn't worry because he, as he looked upon the congregation, he said, they're not going to know the difference anyway. And he really had at it. And he thought he had done quite well. But as the congregation was leaving the church, one of the ladies that had been there many years little old lady walked up to him and said, Son, I don't care what you say, I still believe my Bible. <laughs> so the Bible's not meant to be complicated, and you're certainly not going to get a lot of lofty terms from me this morning. But one I will begin that, that, that it's important. It's important that we, we know what we believe. It's important that, that we know what we believe as individuals, but that what we believe as a congregation. Um, because what we believe will, will affect the way we live our lives. What we believe will affect our church. Um, and, and it's important when you're in a part of a congregation, you become a church member, that you can align yourself, that, that the beliefs of, of that church, that, that organization, that, that, that you agree with the beliefs. Does that mean to a T? Maybe not. But overall, you need, particularly on the basics. Um, in our membership manual, if, if you're a new member, we have a manual. And in that, we've publicly stated the, the core beliefs of New Covenant Fellowship. In the very first uh, uh, statement in our statement of faith is, is, uh, is this. We believe the Old and New Testaments of the Bible are the only inspired, infallible, and authoritative word of God. The only. Second Timothy 3, 16, 17 says this. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. At NCF, we believe the Bible to be inspired of God, the infallible word of God, and thereby it becomes the standard for which we judge all things. If, 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 if something... If something in your life, something else, if something cannot pass 
the judgment of God's word, then you need to be suspect of it. You need to consider it. Because we believe that this is our God. The, the original Greek word for inspired, it, it means literally, if you look at it, God breathed. And this signifies that God is the author of, of these scriptures. Now, we know that God used people to, to pen uh, the scriptures, and the, the writers were God's appointed spokespersons. And now, they retained their own writing style, but they were so guided by the Holy Spirit that the end product generated was God's product. God was the producer. God was the manufacturer. The man was the pen. He was the instrument. The Bible is, is, is trustworthy. It's reliable. It's inerrant. The Bible, we believe, here at New Covenant, we believe that, that our basis for living comes from the Bible. And, and that's the way, if you're a born-again believer, that's the way your life is should be based. Biblically, God's word. You need the answer to some, God's word to place. You need uh, uh, to be enthused, God's word will do it. You, you need to be corrected, God's word will do it. You need advice, God's word will do it. You, you, you need to know how to handle someone, God's word will do it. We base our decisions and our priorities according to what is revealed in this book. And to deny the divine origin of Scripture is, is to open the door to unbelief. All the teachings that have been in this church, all of them, need to be tossed overboard if they do not line up with God's Word. Now, I have not heard so. Not from this pulpit. My wife will tell you, I spend hours preparing a small sermon because I want to make sure that I'm taking the scripture correctly. That I'm not just, I, I, I don't try to develop an idea and then go find scripture. You understand what I'm saying? I'll take a subject and I'll find the scripture, but I'll let that lead me into what I put on my notes and what I say. I must have hit that thing accidentally. I did. The 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 uh, Martin Luther. He was put on trial for his beliefs and his opinions, and he stated that if they wanted him to recant them, to deny them, and he said this. He said if he could be shown where his views disagreed with Scripture. If you could prove me wrong from the Bible, he would gladly change. Uh, the scriptures, not man-made rules or tradition, was Luther's sole basis of authority. So he declared to the council, here I stand, I can do nothing else. Oh, to live my life that way. So let's take a look at the, a quick look at, the, at, the, at this book, at the the Bible, the, the instruction book, the, the owner's manual, if, if you will. And let's start with some uh, basics. First, we'll, we'll give you some curious facts. The number of chapters in the Bible, 1,189. The number of verses, 31,173. Number of words, 700. You say, well, why is that important? You'll hear in a minute. Number of words, 775,693. Longest chapter, Psalm 119. Shortest chapter, Psalm 117. Longest verse, Esther 8-9. Shortest verse, one of my favorites, John 11:35. Longest book in the Old Testament, Psalms. Longest book in the New Testament, Luke. And the curious fact, we have 66 books in our Bible, 
The book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. Our Bible has two parts. The book of Isaiah is in two parts. The book of Judgment, 39 chapters like our Old Testament. The book of Comfort, 27 chapters like our New Testament. So now let's look at some literary facts. This is fun information, okay? God's written, <coughs> God's written revelation of his will to mankind, his creation. There are 66 books, two testaments. Testament means covenant, and covenant means agreement. The Old Testament has 39 books, and it deals with the covenant of the law. It's an account of a nation, the nation of Israel. The New Testament is 27 books. It deals with the covenant of grace. It's an account of a man, the man who was God in the flesh, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The central theme of the, of the Bible's salvation through Jesus Christ has 40 authors. It's composed on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. It was written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. Fortunately, I'm fluent in all three. So. Our Bible is a very diverse book. It's not a book of history, but it certainly is historical. It's not a book of science. Yet it is scientific. It's not a book of just facts, yet it is factual. The English word Bible comes from the Greek root of biblos, which is uh, uh, papyrus, uh, rose made from the inner bark of, of, the, of the papyrus tree. And although the word Bible comes from a word that was once used for all written documents, it soon came to refer almost exclusively to the scriptures, to the Bible. It's the most unique book ever written because it claims its author to be God. It declares that it is the very word of God himself. The expression, the Lord said, or the Lord spoke, occurs over 2,000 times in the Old Testament alone. The Old Testament writers state over 2,700 times that what they were writing is the Word of God. Speaking of the Old Testament, let me read to you uh, some a scripture that the Apostle, the Apostle Paul said this, 2 Peter 1, 19-21. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is God's authorized word. It is God breathed. You can count on it. You can stand on it. It was created by him, inspired by him, given to us by him. Remember when Jesus was, was in the desert and he was tempted? He said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he was quoting scripture, Deuteronomy 8.3. Jesus said that man does not live on bread, but on what? The word of God. That comes from where? The mouth of God. This comes from the mouth of God. It cannot be wrong. Now, you, you would say, well, these men that wrote it, they, 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 they wrote it in different languages. They wrote it uh, in different grammatical and literary styles. So if it was breathed by God, why is it it was different styles and different languages? Because God inspired men to write his words, using each man's own style, language, background. But that does not in any way diminish the certainty, the truth, and the infallibility of the New Testament. Give you an example. In the Midwest, they might say, 
the mouse ran about the house. In Tidewater, Virginia, they might say, the most run about the host. In Europe, they might say, the rodents uh, scurried hither and yon. And in East Tennessee, we'd say that rat ran all over the place. But it doesn't matter how you say it, there's still a rat in the woodpile. It means the same thing. The Bible is divine in origin. God originated it. He supervised the production of it. It's not creative writing or inspired in the same way we think of people like Shakespeare or Mozart or Rembrandt being inspired. Theirs was a gift of genius. But those who wrote the Bible were, 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 were guided by an inward work of the Holy Spirit of the living God. They wrote in, in such a way that God got written exactly what he wanted to say. It was too important. It's God's instructions to us. It's, it's our life pattern. It's, it's our judgment pattern. We do here in this church believe the Bible to be the inspired, infallible Word of God. Infallible. Webster. Means incapable of error. Never wrong. Not liable to fail, to go wrong, or to make a mistake. Incapable of error in setting forth doctrine on faith and morals. I think we can all agree that God does not make mistakes. If he said it, it is so. But is the Bible reliable? Can we trust today's copies? It, it's true that we no longer have the very original manuscripts or the original letters, the original papers. What we have are copies. In fact, uh, I, I, these, these nicely printed Bibles that we hold today or have on our phones or wherever you happen to have one, they come from earlier hand-copied copies. And in, in the days before uh, printing presses and computers and all these, all these things, there were scribes and, who made copies of the Bible. And they were extremely meticulous in copying and preserving the, the sacredness of, of, of the text. And they, they followed very strict, Jewish scribes followed very strict rules. A scribe did not copy sentence for sentence or even word for word. He copied letter for letter. If a page had 288 words in it, the copy had to have 288 words. The scribes knew exactly how many letters were in each of the books of Scripture. As an example, there are 78,064 letters in the book of Genesis. They knew that. They counted them. They knew how many of each letter appeared in a book. They knew, knew the letter that marked the exact center of a book, and each of these tests had to match up exactly, or that copy was thrown away, and they began again. Good example, though, of the reliability of our Bible is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. These ancient writings were penned 100 years before the time of Christ. And they were stored in jars near the Dead Sea. They were discovered in 1947, and they represented the greatest biblical discovery of the century. Something that's amazing to me, do you know what the man that found them, what he did for a living? He was a shepherd. He was looking for some of his sheep. He thought they may have wandered up in a cave. But to be sure it was safe to go in and get them, he threw a stone in there so that it would strike a sheep or it would startle the sheep and he'd know they were there. Instead, he heard breakage like of a, of a clay pot and he went to investigate a shepherd. That's just amazing to me. Now, before that discovery, the old, oldest manuscripts of the, of the Old Testament dated back to about 900 uh, A.D., now scholars possess copies, some copies of the Old Testament that were a thousand years older than that. So how much difference would they be in those copies and current copies? So they began to, to compare 
the current book of Isaiah, because it was almost a full book in, in the scrolls, to the newly discovered copy that was a thousand years old, and they discovered this. After a thousand years, there was only one word different. They found some errors, but it was spelling things. That's amazing. It proves the reliability of our scripture. The, 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 the uh, earliest fragments of the New Testament date approximately 30 years after the originals, after the letters. The earliest copies of Aristotle's Poetic, 1,400 years after the original. The earliest copy you see of the copy of the Odyssey by Homer, 2,200 years after the original. Yet people take those as being archaeological findings, scientific findings, all tend to back up the scripture. So we believe the Bible to be the inspired, infallible Word of God, and thereby the standard by which we judge all things, and it should be the standard by which we lead our lives. You can't change it. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. You can't go off on a tangent with your own interpretations. It has to match up. But I remember as a child, you know the tags on things? Usually they're on something that folds or uh, something that you might get, a kid could get caught up in or something. It says, do not remove this tag under penalty of law. You ever seen those? Huh? And on pillows, yeah. And, and uh, they, 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 when I was a kid, it freaked me out. I'd see that tag, and it would freak me out, and, and I, 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 but it intrigued me, too, because I think, well, what if, you know? Uh, but I didn't want to face a firing squad. Then it occurred to me that probably, as a kid, they would punish my parents. After all, they should want a kid, right? So I tore a couple off, and I waited. No tag patrol, no tag inspector. No tag police. No one showed up. Ducked out of that one. But then I thought, well, how about the future? What if they happen to come by and say, okay, we need to check all your tags? What about that? So just to be safe, I made a new tag and I put it on with scotch tape. Because I figured the, p the penalty for forgery would be less than the penalty for destruction of the tag. But God has decreed that he wants no forgery of his word, nor does he want misrepresentation or misunderstanding. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I He gives clear and precise instruction regarding his word. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We are told that we, we should not be ashamed to serve our Lord, and when we speak his word, we need to rightly divide it. Now, the Greek word for rightly dividing there is ortho tomeo. Ortho, get it? It means straight, orthodontics. Tomeo, to cut. Ortho tomeo is to make a straight you can't just whack the word up any way you want and cut it into pieces to fit what you want to fit. There is a straight cut. It should be a straight cut. There is no Catholic cut. There is no 
uh, Baptist cut, no Methodist cut, no charismatic cut. There is a straight cut for God's Word. He gives a warning about the handling of His Word. James 3, verses 1 and 2. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brother, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Be careful when you presume to be a teacher. In the, the Message Bible, that same verse, the Message Bible. Don't be in any rush to become a teacher, my friend. Teaching is highly responsible work. Teachers are held to the strictest standards. I stand here, I'm held to a stricter standard. Because at that moment when you do that, <laughs> you come under a higher level of accountability. Titus 2, verse 1 and 2 says this, You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. This Bible has sound doctrine. You teach according to the doctrine that God provided in his word. But even so, Jesus warns us in Matthew 7, 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. In Colossians 2, the apostle Paul warns the people of Colossae that those who sell bottled doctrine may sound and look harmless, but in fact they are peddling spiritual death. The apostle has been encouraging the Colossian church, but in verse 2 he says this, I tell you this, so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Again in verse 8 he says this, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. It needs to line up. It needs to line up. Error was surrounding the Colossians. There were false teachers everywhere. Paul wanted them to guard his flock, his trusted followers. Now how does this apply to us? Paul says that we must beware of hollow and deceptive philosophy. He's cautioning us that not every idea is a good idea. Not every new thought is a true thought. In this age of information, think about it. We're increasingly under a bombardment of, through social media, through video, through audio, through and through the fact that we are, this is another whole subject, but we're taught to be tolerant. But I'm going to tell you what, if tolerant means accepting that Jesus Christ is not the only way to God, I cannot be tolerant of that. Can I be tolerant of the person that believes that? I can be tolerant of the person while I'm trying to lead them to Jesus. That's another subject. I'm going to say, I can't help it. We... We've become experts in, in selling a product. We've become experts in pack, packaging and, and presentation. Look, look what we're using. We've got these laser pointers. And I, remember, I remember years ago going to a meeting when I was with Reynolds, and the meeting opened up, the lights went off, and there were laser beams, pew, 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 over top of our head going everywhere. Boy, I sucked up everything they had to say. <laughs> I remember one time, I think I've told this story here before, we were buying a car for my wife, and we were looking. And we really couldn't find anything that she really liked. We found one that maybe she would like. And then I spotted uh, online a car over uh, on the Motor Mile. And I'd been working at this dealership with this man, and I really liked this guy. I mean, man, he, godly man. He was really doing everything he could to help us. I wanted him to get the sale. And so I didn't want to ride to Maribel, so I called him. I said, look, I said, can you have that car brought over here? He said, I'll go get it. And he did. And I took my wife, and she fell in love with it. Sat down with him and started going through all the business of buying that car. But in the midst of all of it, we were really getting close and 
And it turns out that, uh, as we're talking, that he's a fisherman. I love to fish. He had a boat. I don't. He said, you want to go? I said, when? He said, how about tomorrow? I said, okay. So I met him at the dealership, got in his car with his boat attached to it. We went to the Clinch River. There was two generators running. That's much too swift to suit me. We put the boat in and we drifted and fished for trout. And we caught some trout. But while we were drifting, I began to share my testimony with him. And in my testimony, I said, you know, man, when the, when the Holy Spirit gets hold of you, you know it. I said, I have, I, have, I have felt the Spirit within me so strong. I said, and I've told you this, I said, sometimes, sometimes, I, I, Jesus, I said, I can, I can see him, I can feel him, I can taste him. It's, it's that live, his Spirit within me is that live. He said, yes, the Holy Spirit is a powerful force. And he said, I love those times. I said, me too. I said, and were it not for the death of Jesus, were it not for his sacrifice, I would be a lost man. I said, just think about it. God came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ and sacrificed himself for me. I said, but you know, there's a lot of people who don't believe Jesus is God. And he said this to me. He said, oh yeah, Jesus is God. He's one of the little guys. He said, Jesus is God. Yahweh is God. The Holy Spirit is God. He went through several names from, from, from the Bible. And each one of them was a separate person in his belief. And he looked at me and says, I'm glad you understand this. I said, I don't. I said, you and I are just way on a different track, and you are in error, my friend. We, we, we need to talk. He said, no. He said, I have a book for you to read. I said, really? He said, yeah, the other testament, the Book of Mormon. It all sounded so good, you know? He said, you read this book, and then the Spirit will grab hold of you, and you will believe. And that's what they... Depend on they depend on you reading the Book of Mormon and somewhere something in there giving that kind of light and lovely feeling, you know. And that's the Holy Spirit telling you that the book is true, and He's telling me there's all these gods, and I I started looking at Mormonism. Oh man, it's weird. I'm sorry, it is. Is it a cult? I think so. But I I've got some friends, very good friends, that are Mormon, but they also know I disagree with them. Yeah, some years ago, oh, I got enough time. Some years ago, there were commercials on TV, a lot of them, and and it was a it was a man with a very soft uh, voice, and and uh, he 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 was talking about the guide of his life, and uh, he he tells us, and he said the guides of his life, the Bible. And he 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 says how he learned about Jesus in the Bible. And how Jesus told his disciples about other sheep. This man goes on, very nice man, on TV. He goes on to tell us that these sheep were the Mormons. And then he tells us how we can get a copy of the Book of Mormon, the Other Testament. Now, when you looked at that commercial, it, it's obvious, it was a blatant attempt to deceive weak believers. Because it showed family kids and picnics and, and I'm going to tell you something for the most part what I see Mormons are very dedicated to their families very dedicated very family structured there's some things about that part that we should emulate so but that's that's, that's deception it was purposeful deception purposeful deception that happened False teaching can be very slick. It can appeal to your emotions, your senses of fair play, your senses of honesty, your, 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 your acceptance of ideas or your acceptance of people different from yourself. It may appeal to your spiritual desires and appear as an answer to your thirst for more. It may appear very logical and therefore be difficult to recognize, but there are 
some common characteristics, we can be aware of it. First, it will be subtle most times. It's not a blatant disavowal of accepted belief. It's, it's usually an exaggeration of some kernel of truth. It is one element of the truth taken to an extreme. Most false teaching, it will not stand up and scream, this is a teaching which contradicts the Bible. And on the surface, it may sound as if it does not. Instead, it will take a portion of the Bible and misuse it. It will take one element of the truth to an extreme that discounts the rest of the truth. It's total distortion. It will be attractive. It will offer more. It will offer something you think you do not now have. It will enlighten you, free you, and make you a better person. It will often be Bible quoting. Judaism says Jesus was not the Messiah. Christianity says he was. You can't have it both ways. Islam says that Jesus was not crucified. Christianity says he was. You can't have it both ways. Hinduism says God has often been incarnate. Christianity says God was incarnate only in Jesus Christ. You can't have it both ways. Buddhism says that the world's mysteries will end when we do what is right. Christianity says we cannot do what is right, and the world's mysteries will end when we believe in what is right. Our environment, our entertainment, our workplace, our government, they tell us that alternate lifestyles are equal and acceptable relationally, politically, legally, and religiously. Find it in here for me. I'll be like Martin Luther. Find it in here. Does God love all people? Absolutely. God loves people. Judas, Confucius, born 551 B.C., died 479 B.C., status today, dead. Buddha, born 557 B.C., died 483 B.C., status today, dead. Muhammad. Born 570 A.D., died, uh, I got the wrong date, I got them reversed, 6-3, but anyway, status today, dead. Jesus of Nazareth, there's some controversy here, born approximately somewhere in the neighborhood of 4 B.C., crucified 29 A.D., died 29 A.D., resurrected 29 A.D., status today, alive. This is the truth. You can't bend it. You can't change it. These other things do not line up. I could go on and on and on. Jesus tells us the truth. Jesus said this. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the way, the truth, and the life. You find your way to God through these words. Jesus tells the truth that God is still alive and well and in control, that we have sinned and cannot save ourselves, that we are miserable because of our sin, that we need a Savior, and he is that Savior. He tells us what we need to believe and do, that he is God come to mankind, that he gave his life to pay for our sins and to provide our righteousness, that he can be trusted for life and eternity that he is the source of all truth, and that we are to act on these truths. That is called faith. There is a way for those who are lost, there's a way home. For those who are confused, 
there's a way to put the mixed up pieces back together. For those who feel hopeless, there's a way to real hope. For those who have messed up their lives, there is a way to forgiveness. There is a way, Jesus, the only way. There is a truth, Jesus, the only truth. Infallible. I'm banking my life on it. I have spilled it out. You can chew on it. You can gnaw on it. If you come up with something different, let me know. I'll not be angry. We'll talk about it. But how about bringing something to show where it lines up? That's all I ask. That's all I want. I, I know I've said this. I love you guys. I just love you. Every one of you, I love you. I, I am dedicated to you. I'm dedicated to my pastor and his wife. I do anything I can to help support them. But I do that because I love you guys. God's put that in my heart. What I want for you is the truth. That's what I want for you. And it's found right here. Can we pray?